episode 54. Hello, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host as we listen to eyewitness encounters involving one of the most terrifying cryptids, Dogmen. Before we bring on tonight's first guest, I wanted to let you know if you're a dog maniac and can't get enough of the topic, my buddy Britton Sawin has a YouTube channel with some Dogman related shows. I'd highly recommend you take a look at his channel, he's got some good content there. Tonight's first guest is Robbie Anderson. Robbie, welcome to Dogman Encounters Radio. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Please give us a brief bio on yourself. My name is Robbie Anderson. I've been a touring musician for the past six years. Uh, I also dabble in media arts and figurative arts and pretty much all kind of artistic things. I grew up in southern Florida and as well as a little bit up in the north and North Carolina in the mountains. And uh, that's pretty much about it so far. You said you're a traveling musician. Are you an axe man or what do you play? I do vocals. I do play a little bit of every instrument, but when it comes to live performance, I usually just do vocals. Oh, I've got you. When you were growing up, what kind of interest did you have in cryptids like Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, you name it? I can't say like I was too crazy about it, like searching it up or anything, but any time like Monster Quest or something like that would come on the TV, I'd definitely sit down and watch it for hours and hours. Those things usually interested me, but I'd probably say Bigfoot more than anything because you know, it's like the most common thing you see out there. Oh, sure, yeah, there's no arguing the point that Bigfoot's number one. Not long after we had our pre-interview, you spoke to an older lady who had some very interesting stories to share about a big wolf, as she described it, that was known to go up onto two legs and terrorize people nearby to where she lived in Florida. The name that the people in that area had given this cryptid was the Swamp Dog. Please tell us about the Swamp Dog. Well... As I told you, I'm no expert on it. All I know is what she's told me, but um, she has t- told me a quick few stories about how when she was younger, her parents would tell her about the swamp dog. And from what I've been told, it's usually when you see it at first, it just looks like a normal wolf walking on all fours, or uh, usually it's in, in a very swampy area in the water, probably trying to catch some fish or food, and uh, people stumble upon it you know, when they're hunting or going in their boats. And people describe it as standing up and then going from about probably four to five feet on four legs to about six to seven feet on two legs. And it usually, you know, bears its teeth or looks very aggressive, looks very mean, and then, you know, runs off into a different direction. She never told me that it, uh, any, about any attacks or anything. She, uh, told me about where they, this dog would, uh, would terrorize camping because uh, we have a lot of RV like camping spots around you know southern Florida and even northern Florida all over Florida and people would go out there with their tents and their RVs and she would tell me stories about how this thing would just kind of run through campsites and knock over things and not really like investigate or anything kind of just like barrel through you know what I mean kind of like like a linebacker in football going through the the defensive line kind of like taking out whatever it could, and then just keep going. And, you know, most people would think it's a bear, but from what people said, they're like, they're like wolf prints, you know? Like, and in Florida, we don't really have wolves. There are some wolves, if you look it up on online, but they're very small. They're kind of like small foxes, just as big as they get here. And um, they would just say these foot feet are at least, you know, big enough to have something that, you know, matters. It could be people would think it's Bigfoot, or uh, skunk ape, as they call them down here. And, uh, you know, she would just tell me stories about, you know, when she was a kid, how her parents would tell her about this uh, swamp dog, you know, terrorizing camps and just scaring the living crap out of people who are traveling in through the woods in the swamp. Yeah, from what you just shared, I get the impression that it didn't seem to want to hurt anyone. It just wanted to terrorize people and then move on. 
Um, yeah, that's definitely the vibe I got from it was that it didn't want to eat anybody, but it uh, definitely did want to scare them. That's how it seems. You said you grew up in the southern Florida area of the country. If you were that close to the Everglades, growing up, did you ever hear tales about any other type of werewolf-like creatures down that way? Not really. Um, I kind of lived, like, super south. Like, I was born in the Florida Keys, so I was, like, down, you know, very far away from where there would be any kind of swamps or anything, just island after island, and uh, didn't really hear any stories too much down there. You know, we'd hear, you know, giant sharks and stuff like that, but uh, nothing really about any wolves or dogs or Bigfoot even. Exactly how much experience do you have out in the woods there, Robbie? I wouldn't say like I'm an experienced hunter or anything, but uh, as a kid, I definitely played in the woods a lot. You know, I rode BMX bikes out there, and we would have like little stick wars, you know, shoot each other, bows and arrows we made, and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, But as uh, an avid adventurer, I wouldn't say I'm too experienced. Before you tell us about your encounter, please tell us about where it happened, because your encounter happened at a very unique place. I live in the Danone and Ocala area, um, around north central Florida, and uh, uh, there's a road called High School Road, which the local high school here is on, and it's actually, just so happens to be the road that Jeepers Creepers was filmed on. And uh, the the red barn and everything's there, and the super long road with the fields on the side where the bus gets, you know, uh, the tire gets popped and everything, it stops there. That's that creepy old road we had to go down every day in a bus going to school. But that's uh, the area, it's kind of a odd and ironic area to have an experience, I think. Were you around that area when Jeepers Creepers was filmed, or what? Actually, I still lived in the Keys. Actually, it was one of the first movies I went to the movie theater ever to see with my dad. I was about six years old when it came out. I was still down south. I was not in this area. All right, Robbie, please tell us about your encounter, beginning with when you were leaving the studio that night, and take us all the way through when you told the first person that you told about your encounter. All right. Well, it was probably a good four or five months ago at this point. I was, you know, a late session recording, trying to get some ideas flowing and get some new songs out there for a strong comeback after taking a break for a year and just kind of being not around social media or anything. I took a break to myself to, you know, just revitalize myself and, you know, get some new ideas coming out. And uh, after a long day of recording, it was probably... Got to be 2, 3 a.m. It was just really, really late, and I was super tired. And uh, I was heading down uh, through the back roads because it's just uh, a lot easier. Because we, we have these, our, our traffic lights are the worst. Like, they, it's like red light in the middle of the night for, like, five minutes, I swear. Like, for no reason. It's just like, we're just staying there. And uh, so I just avoid all the traffic lights and go through the back roads. And uh, I was uh, turning onto high school road. And probably as I was getting probably maybe 50 to 100 feet down the road, I saw something kind of crouched in the middle of the road there. And so I stopped because, you know, I didn't want to hit a, a cow or, you know, I thought it might have been some roadkill or something. You know, I don't want to hit it. My car is pretty low down to the ground, so if I hit it, it's probably going to, you know, screw me all up. And uh, so I stopped, and I probably get like maybe 10 to f- maybe 5 to 10 feet away from it. And... Uh, I noticed that this thing's a lot bigger than I thought it was. It was kind of like dark brownish, but like as it kind of got towards its leg, it was like really reddish brownish. Like it was kind of like two toned. And uh, I just kept the like, first thing I remember thinking myself was like, uh, "That's definitely not a like a raccoon or something." What I thought it was, or a cow. You know, I was like, "That's weird." And I noticed uh, it looked back at me, and it kind of and then it started standing up and this is when I got really scared because like I said my, my car is pretty low bearing to the ground so this thing easily towered over my car because I could probably like, step over my car if I really wanted to and this thing was just massive like it just stood up and just like looked at me and uh, I remember it had like really dark glowing 
imagine like if you're like seeing like a Yu-Gi-Oh character or something. I don't know if you've ever seen that show, but like how like all their monsters are like really dark, glowing red eyes, and that kind of is what the first thing kind of ran through my head. It looked kind of like you know like blood. It was kind of like glowing blood eyes, and it's kind of was just kind of like panting like a dog, kind of. It's like its mouth was slightly open, and I just remember it kind of like panting a little bit. Or that's what it looked like it was doing. And um, then it kind of ever so swiftly turned and just bolted into the uh, uh, the cow fields that were surround this entire road. And these cow fields have, like, pretty high fences. And the fences are barbed wire and everything. And this thing just kind of gracefully doesn't even look like it had to jump. just kind of walks over this fence and just keeps going, and, uh, well, swiftly walked, like, it, it wasn't like, you know, walking nonchalantly, you know, with no cares or anything, but, uh, it's just, like, it didn't even look like it had to jump or even hop, it just kind of just went right over this fence, went right into the woods, and I never saw it after that, it's kind of sat there in disbelief for probably a good 30 seconds, and then just hauled down the road and all the way home. When it was crouched down in the road there, did you ever get an idea what it might have been doing? Um, you know, my first thought was maybe it was, you know, eating something, but like I said, I didn't notice anything else in the road there. It was just kind of crouching there, and my second thought was maybe it was, you know, taking a break, because it did look like it was panting a bit, um, because its mouth was kind of open as dogs kind of, when get, when they're hot, you know how, like, they kind of just keep their mouth open a little bit? That's kind of what I have been thinking, but, you know, I really have no idea what it could have been, you know, doing, just chilling there in the middle of the road. You talked about its size. You said it looked like it might have been able to step over your car. You talked about how easily it went over the high cattle fence. You ever get an impression? How tall do you think this thing was? Honestly, like, I felt like um, I've met Shaq in real life, and I felt like he was, like, the size of Shaq. <laughs> like, he was at least six, seven feet tall. Like, he was very, very big. Did you get a good look at its leg structure to know what kind of legs it had? Were they canine style or hominid style? Um, so I really didn't get too much of a good look because, you know, once he, once it got out of the way of my car, you know, my lights weren't shining on anymore. So it was blending in very well with the dark. And I didn't see too much of its legs. And I was just way too focused on its, its, its kind of its head, trying to figure out, you know, if it wanted to eat me or, you know, if it was going to attack me or what it was going to do. But I, I, I unfortunately didn't get too much of a good look at its legs. As it was going past you, what was the distance when it was at its closest? Easily touching the car. Like, I have no idea if it did, but uh, I remember when it did turn... I had this feeling like, you know, it was going to, like, flip the car or something, you know, go, like, full Hulk or something. But uh, definitely when it was turning, its arm and hand was definitely very, so close to the car that it might have actually touched my car. When you got that good look at it in the headlights, you mentioned the two-tone color it seemed to have. Without me being too specific with this question, did you notice any other peculiar quality it had as far as its markings or color went. I'm pretty sure I told you in the pre-interview where it kind of had like a, almost kind of like hyena kind of looking thing, you know, where they have kind of like little, uh, almost kind of like cheetah print kind of looking little, uh, like U's towards the bottom of this waist area. You know, like where the legs and the waist meet. The waist and the legs meet kind of like where the colors start to shift almost. I noticed where there was kind of like a little, look kind of like almost like wounds almost. Like it was kind of like dark kind of like used, like kind of like a horse hoof kind of, but you know, like not as big. Well, that's interesting. You didn't mention anything about the hyena prints in the pre-interview. This is the first I had heard of that, but I want to share something with you. If dogmen have hyena prints, for whatever reason, they almost always have them from the waist down. On only a very few occasions have I heard about people reporting dogmen that had hyena prints like that above the waist. I don't know what that's all about, but what you're telling me, it blends perfectly with what I'd expect to hear. What kind of weight would you expect this thing to have? Oh, man. Um, I feel like 
like it kind of was massive, but not like in a fat way, you know, like very muscular. So I feel like it was definitely it's got to be like kind of like six hundred pounds maybe, but you know, it's got to have that muscle mass to be able to move that quickly with that weight. Um, but I definitely feel like it'd be at least six hundred pounds. It must have been a specimen, to say the least. Since your window was up, you probably couldn't smell anything, but I still want to ask you if you did hear any sounds or smell any smells when this thing was right there by your car. Uh, I think, you know, there's so much adrenaline at the moment when I was there that I don't remember smelling or hearing anything. I do remember hearing its feet kind of patter, you know, when it started running, but I, I don't remember, you know, hearing any, like, noises it was making from its mouth or... uh any smells. Moving on, you said that you never got the impression that Dogman wanted to hurt you, but did you ever get the impression it was upset about you being there, interrupting its actions or activities, whatever it had been doing? Um, yeah, I definitely didn't. From the actions it kind of did as it just kind of ran away, it didn't feel like it wanted to hurt me at all. And when it looked at me, it looked super scary, to say the least, but I didn't feel like it wanted to cause harm to me. Um, but, you know, I could be reading that wrong, you know. Um, but uh, I don't feel like it was upset with me or, you know, that I was interrupting it or whatever. I, I feel like it was more kind of, like, confused maybe because it kind of just got up and was like, am I in the way or something? And then kind of just left. So I don't, I feel like it was maybe more confused than anything. With that being such wide open country, it sure does make you wonder why something like that would decide to take a nap in the middle of a highway like that when it's got all those places where it could do that and never be seen. Your instance there is not the only time where they've done something like that. A lot of other people have been in the same type of situation as what you found yourself in that night. Have you ever heard about any dogman encounters in that area that other people have had? Not in this area exactly, besides uh, the Swamp Dog stories I've heard down south from Edna, I haven't really heard any other Dogman sightings. When I asked you about it, you did send me that link on your website to the Dogman encounter in Florida, but besides that, I really have not heard anything besides those few stories. Well, that's a good thing then, at least you don't seem to have a population of them down there if you did you'd probably hear about more encounters down that way. But moving on, when you hear friends talk about heading out to camp, fish, you name it, do you try to steer them away from doing those activities now because you know they're out there, or what? Um, I don't. I actually love the woods, you know. Um, Every time with my friends, we just go out and sit by the creeks up in North Carolina and just really enjoy it. Um, uh, I wouldn't you know, steer them away, maybe because I love nature and I I love the trees and I I love just everything about it. And if they're out there, I'm definitely going to be a little bit more careful and a little bit more uh, cautious about the areas I'm in and be a little bit more respectful now, knowing that, you know, they're out there. But um, I don't think I, you know, try to keep people from going to enjoy the outdoors. I hate the fact that you did have that encounter, but at least it did give you the upper hand to know that they are out there, so that now you can adjust your behavior to hopefully protect yourself more than if you didn't even know that they were out there in the first place. So I guess there is some kind of positive spin that we could put on this. But what kind of changes have you made in your life as a result of having that encounter? You just mentioned that you still like to go out into the wilderness and enjoy various things, but I'm sure there are some kind of changes you have made to help protect yourself from another run-in with one of these things. Well, I definitely don't travel that road at night anymore. Um, I definitely do get through the long stoplights now. But, um, I mean, I really don't know how too many changes in the area I live to protect myself or try to avoid them because, uh, I mean, like, I've just, I, I grew up in this town a little bit, um, for like, every second, like, for like my teenage years, this is kind of where I was, and this is kind of where I, I, uh, made a lot of my memories, so like, I kind of just, in the same routine, so I really don't know how to change it up to 
avoid it. The way I see it is like, you know, it was just fate, you know, everything happens for a reason. And if I'm meant to meet up with these things again, and hopefully it's going to be as passive as it was. But really, uh, besides not taking that road at night anymore, I really don't know what else I can do to kind of ensure I don't see one again. You mentioned not traveling that road after dark. Does that mean also you can't go camping again now that you know they're out there? Uh, that's a possibility. I, I never really camped too much as a kid, and I don't like really being woods at night anyway. So I definitely don't camp. Um, <laughs> and that's one more reason to add to it as to why I don't camp. Well, regardless of your reasoning for not liking the woods, now that you've had this encounter, I don't think anyone could blame you for having a strong dislike for being out there after dark, to say the least. But is there anything noteworthy that happened that night that I'm missing here you'd like to reveal? Um, I mean, as cliche as it sounds, it was very bright that night. Because it wasn't a full moon, but uh, the, the moon was uh, was um, three-quarters of the way full, and it was just casting a very bright light. So, like, things were a little bit more visible. Like, once they got towards the trees, like I said, it gets a lot darker, you know, the shade of the trees and everything. But, um, the road was pretty, you know, br a lot brighter than it normally would be on that road, because there's no street lights or anything out there. So, I mean, it wasn't like, uh, daytime bright out there, but it was bright enough to where, uh, if I happened to get out of the car, I could probably, you know, I could see, you know, my car from at least a foot away. But usually on that road, it's it's pitch black. It's you know it's uh you know if there is something out there, you're not going to see it, no matter you know if you have a light or not. Yeah, considering the history of that area, it's not like you need a dogman running around there to make that place any creepier than it already is. But do you know of a high number of people or pets that have gone missing in that area? Um, I do know. Um, uh, when I was. A few years younger, probably before I moved up north, um, a lot of cattle did start dying. Um, and it wasn't just kind of like peeling over, they were, they were attacked, you know, but people thought they were just, you know, a large number of coyotes moving down into the area or something like that. And, um, I mean, our area has coyotes, but, and foxes and stuff like that, but they're very small, like, they're the size of house cats here, like, they're very tiny. Um, so, like, I was like, there's no way that something that small is taking down these cows, because these cows are huge, you know? Um, so I was like, there's no way. So, um, and, like, they weren't, like, mutilated or anything, but, like, they were, like, definitely, they were, like, you know, gnawed on and eaten a bit up. And, um, I did, uh, there was a cow field right behind where I live, and I do remember, you know, seeing a few dead cows out there at, when I was younger, wondering kind of, like, why? Because, they, you know, all the cows, you know, they were there for years as I was growing up, and we used to mess around with them, you know, like uh, run out in the cow field and get chased by the bull and climb up the, the lonely tree in the middle of the pasture. And I do remember seeing a few dead ones there and noticing around town that there definitely were a, a lot of cows getting taken out. But um, I, besides that, I really don't know of any stories of, like, dogs or cats or pets going missing. When you and your buddies were out there in the pasture giving the bull and the cows a hard time, did you get into any cow tipping? Um, we tried to cow tip, but uh, we we were just we didn't know what we were doing. So when we were getting near it, we we start laughing, trying to push it, and it was so much. It's so much harder than it looks. Like they're so much heavier. <laughs> like we're like, okay, we're just gonna push this thing over, and then it was just like, like we push all our force, and nothing would happen. <laughs> like it wouldn't even like stumble it would just kind of like wake up and look at us <laughs> and we'd start running you know it's funny I used to work with a guy who as a kid used to love to cow tip but he went out one time and made the mistake of trying to tip a bull and that cured him of his fascination with doing that it wasn't pretty how that ended out but anyway do you have any closing comments you'd like to share with this yeah, if you do have any encounters, definitely contact Vic. You definitely do feel a lot better after you talk to somebody who is open-minded and knows, you know, about these creatures. 
as Vic always says, there's no expert in this field, but an unbiased ear is definitely something that goes a long way when it comes to getting the grief and the, you know, like the pressure of, you know, having this on you with no one to really talk to about. If you do see one, I mean, I wouldn't let it affect your life too much. I mean, I do understand, like, it's definitely traumatic, and it definitely has me scared of the nighttime now. I used to love the nighttime, but, uh, try to, you know, just coexist with it, because, I mean, these things have obviously been around for hundreds of thousands of years, you know, probably as long as we've been around, maybe longer, and we've coexisted with them this long. Uh, I'm sure we can continue to coexist that way, but the more we invade the forest, then I'm sure they get more aggressive, but that's a whole different topic. And, I mean, I just uh, definitely contact Vic and tell him your stories and your encounters and keep uh, keep up the great show. Well, thanks again so much for coming on the show, Robbie, and thanks for those good words. I really appreciate it. Of course, anytime. Big fan of the show. Oh, well, thanks for listening. Well, have yourself a great night, okay? I will, and you too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Our second guest tonight is Andrew Maselli. Andrew, welcome to Dogman Encounters Radio. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks for having me, Vic. Oh, it's great to have you here, buddy. Andrew, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Okay, my name is Andrew Maselli. I was born in East Los Angeles, California. My grandparents were full-blooded Native American, Apache. My other side of my family I don't know because my father was orphaned, Italian. I'm an artist. For the past, oh, say, seven years, I've been living overseas. I'm a backpacker. I like to travel the world, but uh, I've been living in Asia, specifically Cambodia. I've been in Cambodia for about the past seven years. I help run an orphanage over there, working with human trafficking prevention, and got the orphanage up and running. Then I was working with landmine removal, like EOD, and I was an educator. I was currently riding a motorcycle. I rode a motorcycle across Thailand to Burma, to Laos, and Laos, and I was in a bad accident in Cambodia. So the past two years, I was one year, nine months on my back. My leg was severed. They reattached my leg in Saigon. I just spent two years in the hospital, one year getting surgeries. I've had nine surgeries. And uh, I just spent the last year learning to walk again. And now I am good. I am up and running. And I am currently in the Emerald, they call it the Emerald Triangle, up here in Humboldt County, California, Northern California. Beautiful place up in the Redwoods. And that's about it. (laughs) I'll tell you what, buddy. I'm so glad that you're back to good health and to the point where you're dangerous again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that's good news right there you're doing this interview from a very unique place please tell us about that well yeah i'm up here in northern california my encounter which you'll hear about actually happened at a place called psalms bar orleans it's very close to what some of your listeners might recognize bluff creek or the patterson film was filmed, the Bigfoot, that original film, the Patterson film, very close to that. So close that I used to go drive to Bluff Creek to go get coffee. So it's pretty close. I am right, was right up the road. I used to live up there. We're on the Hoopa Indian Reservation. And yeah, it's a really, really beautiful place. And I'm actually doing this interview from a few miles south. And I'm Actually, if I stand up, I'm currently looking at the riverbed where the Patterson film was filmed, you know, the sandbars and the water. And I'm very, very 
close. So I'm in the I'm up at the Hoopa Indian Reservation, just south of Bluff Creek in Northern California. I can't even imagine how neat it would be to knock around that area. An area that's so famous and well known and everything, that must be unreal. Yes, very beautiful too. Very beautiful. And by the way, everyone, before we really get underway with the show here, if you're wondering if Andrew's half as nice as he seems, trust me when I tell you the guy is. I've been talking to him for some time, wanting to bring him on the show forever. And Andrew is as advertised. He's just about the nicest guy you'll ever meet. Great guy. Well, thank you, Vic. I appreciate that. And same to you. (laughs) Well, thank you. Not hardly on my account, but I appreciate the good words anyway. All right, Andrew, let's dive into this thing. First question I've got for you is, what kind of role does the dogman play in Apache culture? Okay, well, the dogman in particular, I'm not too sure of. Like I said, I am half Native American Apache. We are from the White Mountains, Arizona. I did have the unique gift, I guess you'd say, of my grandfather. I was raised by my grandma and grandfather, who are full-blooded Apache, and my grandfather used to babysit me, and at night he would rock me to sleep, and he'd always tell me stories. That's what put me to sleep. Actually, him and his father, he grew up in the woods, in the mountains, Uh, His father used to go actually ride, I think it was his horse or his donkey, up in the Superstition Mountains or something, he would tell me. But I didn't get a lot of the, you know, it wasn't like he was an elder, so I don't have a lot of information on how it plays exactly in the culture. But I have heard a few things. For instance, uh, an old-timer told me that in our culture, we, I guess, would say, and I've heard a lot of dogmen described as almost a coyote, but walking coyote, and apparently when the creator was creating man and coyote, coyote wanted man to be on all fours. That, I know, is part of the, the legend and the culture. So there was a kind of a back and forth between man and coyote. Coyote wanted man to be on force. So anyways, that's about what it is. Also, coyotes are tricksters, represented as a trickster, whatever that may mean by maybe being on all fours, being able to walk. I have a few theories on why dogmen are around Native American men burial mounds, but maybe we'll get to that later. (laughs) Sure, I'd love to cover that. One thing I'm hoping you can answer for me, I've seen Sasquatch depicted on Native American totem poles, but I've yet to see any dogmen on one. Any idea why that is? No, that you, you've got me on that also. If anything, I believe dogmen in our culture, in the native culture at least, is more of a protector. And I have a theory, my personal theory, is why dogmen are seen around burial mounds, Native American burial mounds. Maybe it's not so much that the dogmen are attracted to there. Possibly, it would cross my mind that maybe Like warriors are buried there and such. Basically, there's places where dogmen, native people know where dogmen are, territories, and they choose to bury their dead there knowing that a lot of people aren't going to go into those areas. And maybe it's not something you want to advertise. You know what I mean? That sounds like a good idea if you don't want someone to mess with graves. If you know of a hot spot for these things, I can't think of a better place to bury your loved ones. Yes, especially if parents are telling their kids, don't go in there, it's dangerous, knowing it's a dangerous place, and you want to keep you know, your loved ones at peace or rest and honor them for resting into the afterlife. Well, that would sort of makes sense. That does make really good sense. To go back to something you brushed over just a bit ago in the interview here, you said that in your culture they're seen as being protectors. I'm kind of foggy on something here. 
if they're seen and portrayed as being protectors, do the Apache elders say to fear them, not fear them, respect them, or both? Actually, I'd say both. Definitely, common sense would say to fear them, but definitely more than anything in uh, Apache culture and all Native cultures is respect of all living things. So I would say both, but more than the other. One more than the other would be to respect, for sure. Oh, I see. In that Bluff Creek area, how do people look at the whole dogman phenomenon? Well, to be honest, that's a funny question, because even before the interview, my own nephews were teasing me. It's really funny. Willow Creek up here, Bluff Creek, around here, Hoopa is the Sasquatch hotspot of the planet. I mean, you know, this is this is where it's happening, where, you know, there's a lot of uh, sightings, and the culture here is well knows about them for a long time. The culture up here, actually, and Native culture in general, looks at Sasquatch as a clan. Now, I know we're talking about dogmen. You just don't hear anything about dogmen up here. There are so many angles you can approach it from. It's really hard to figure out half of this stuff. All you can do is just take bits and pieces of info and do the best you can to formulate some opinions, I guess. Yes, yes, definitely. And that's all we're doing. And in my heart, I'm sure there's dogmen packs. I'm sure there's Sasquatch clans, and they don't want to be found for whatever reason, which may not be a bad thing with humans. You know what we generally do when we find a species? It doesn't really last that long. But anyways, yeah, you don't really know. So I'm just guessing. This is just my everything. I hope I don't offend anyone out there with my opinions. These are just my opinions. Oh, everyone's entitled to their own opinion, so no harm, no foul there. What you just mentioned does tie into my next question, though, which is, why do you think it is that the cryptid community accepts the existence of Sasquatch so much more readily than the existence of Dogmen? I believe probably because Dogmen is such a stretch for anybody who's grounded in quote-unquote everyday reality. You know what I mean? It's just such a far stretch. Sasquatch, you think, well, the average person, you know, missing link. I mean, it's it's a prime. Is it a primate? Is it human? It's so close to us. But dogmen, from my understanding, you have dogmen from what they call the dire wolf, hellhound, all the way up to the dogman that can just rear up all the way to you're more of an expert on any of this than me, but dogmen that, you know, they, they, they basically walk and run on two legs. They just go down on all fours sort of to get speed, get back up. And then you have dogmen that are almost to me personally, personally, like I said, it's just an opinion, but I think possibly even, made it with a Sasquatch. And that's where you get the almost baboon looking like the Seven Shoots photo, just where they're massive, almost Sasquatch slash dogmen. Who knows what goes on out here (laughs) in the woods. It is hard to figure out how they can have so many different looks. I mean, they do come in all different shapes and sizes, just like what you mentioned, trying to figure out where they came from and how they wound up looking like that. Well, Vic, my personal thought is, uh, like I said, it's just my opinion, but what if, I'm just saying what if, what if back before, as all the legends say, there was an advanced culture that was messing with genetic material, and therefore you'd have, just say they wanted to make a bigger, more powerful beast of burden, but that beast of burden over how many tens of thousands of years goes out and is in the wilderness, and it mates with this, and it mates with that. And before you know it, you've got everything from almost an upright standing, basically timber wolf that's seven feet tall, to something with doesn't have hocks, but has actually kneecaps. I mean, I've heard of everything, and doesn't have paws, but has fingers. So maybe if there was something going on in the past, whether it was natural or 
a little bit of help with genetic manipulation, maybe these things just started evolving naturally on their own. And that's why you have so many different species and so many different looks. Some look like, I like the Onaway photo, looks like a chow almost, you know. The thing I saw in my encounter, that was just the combination of things. Some of them look like a Sasquatch, literally a Sasquatch wolf. So, yeah, it's interesting, but I'm sure they evolve each in their own way, and the hybrids are happening all the time. I sent you that photo of the puppy that we found up here in the woods, and that thing is, man, I mean, what is that, a chow, timber wolf, a chow, a kita? It's just a funky-looking dog, but it's definitely not a purebred, I don't think. You know, I don't know. It's a feral dog. Anyways, uh, that's that's an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've all got them. It is awfully hard to figure out the origins. I am a believer in the fact that there are aliens out there. Whether or not aliens came here eons ago and seeded the earth with what we call today dogmen, I don't know. I'm not qualified to even make an opinion on that, but I guess anything's possible. As far as them interbreeding with Sasquatch and winding up looking like type 3s do with their hominid style legs and everything, that I have a hard time believing. But anyway, let's move on to the next topic here, Andrew. What we've yes. all been waiting for. I've been looking forward to giving you a chance to talk about that encounter that you and Andy had. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay, so back in the day, this uh, I had my encounter at 95. And let me just state from the get-go that I'm not saying I saw a dog man. But what I saw, definitely, I have no idea what it was. I've never seen anything like it, and the closest I could relate it to was I had no reference point. After I had my encounter, the only thing I can relate it to was what they called a hellhound or a devil dog or a dire wolf. And when I saw him, I said, I have seen the dire wolf or all three of those into one. Anyways, okay, back in the mid-90s, I used to, me and my buddy, we're quite seasoned travelers. We were following a band called the Grateful Dead. I'm sure you've heard of them. And we were making a living going from concert to concert, selling food and stuff. And it was just a great time in life. We were traveling every state across the country. Been down pretty much every dirt road you can imagine from here to New York and back. Did that for several years. But when they would stop what they call tour, we would always head on up here to Hoopa and hang out and sort of recoup for a couple months, you know, and uh, just hang out there on the Salmon and the Klamath where they come together. I actually lived, I had, I literally, because I'm native, I lived with my sister. We had a cabin literally on the bluff overlooking where the salmon and the clamets come together. Phenomenal, beautiful, very special place in the native culture. So I'm up here, down the road, I had a friend that lived, and me and my buddy, we used to go hang out there. So we're down at the place at my buddy's, and we had, I remember we had run out of cigarettes. So we went to the store, we went down the road, it's a windy road, and uh, it's like that same sandbar area, that same very area where the Patterson film was filmed. Anyways, we were driving down that road, we went to the store, got cigarettes, and when we were coming back, there's a big bend in the road, it does an actual C, a big C, so you are not, not able to see what's as you're coming around the road. But boom, right there, dead in the center of the road, was sitting the biggest, massive, crazy looking, it almost looked like a cross between the only, I had no reference point at the time. A black bear was, it was the size of like a, a small black bear, not a medium sized black bear, black bear, a uh, canine wolf thing. That's the only way I could describe it. It was insane, massive. It was just a, a crazy moment. It was like, what? We actually drove off the road. 
to go around it. Now, I know people have had encounters in the past where they might have seen something dark, but I saw this thing clearly. Everything. Locked eyes with it. Everything. Massive. I'd say, to describe it, I got a very good look at it. Sitting in the middle of the road had to be for sitting, sitting down, had to be uh, about four and a half feet from sitting down to the tops of its ears. It had pointed ears. It had a muzzle like a wolf. It looked just like a massive, it looked almost like a, a timber wolf crossed with a grizzly bear. That's the only way I could describe it. It was massive. And um, it just had this bizarre look, man. I mean, it had the most bizarre look that it actually was, I don't know if I want to say annoyed. I'll just say it, annoyed that we saw it. It actually had a look to it. And we, we actually went off the road to go around it like, what? We skidded. Yeah, what is that? And it just looked at us. And it just sort of, that's when I say it looked annoyed, and it just, we made eye, locked eye contact, and it just sort of trotted off down into the uh, riverbank. And, yeah, that was it. You know, it was a brief encounter, but it was, I mean, it's it, it stuck with me to this day. And I'll tell you one thing. I used to hitchhike that road every single day. For years, I hitchhiked that road. I never hitchhiked that road again. <laughs> and I don't scare easy. I don't scare easy. Yeah, I can't say I'd blame you for not wanting to hitchhike on that road after seeing something like that. In the pre-interview, you said the creature's shoulders looked strange. What was so strange about them? They were massive. The thing almost looked like, there you go, here you go. If you, you crossed a, a timber wolf, a grizzly bear, and a hyena. Because its back was huge, absolutely massive. The shoulders and back, absolutely massive. Almost like a, you know how a dog has its arms go straight down from its shoulders? This went out almost like it was muscular, like it had biceps. It was just massive, just massive, like a pit bull. It was, it was just so strange looking. It just made no sense. You're like, you, you can't believe what you're seeing when you see something like this, other than get the heck out of here <laughs> <laughs> yeah that had to be one heck of a sight to see i can't even imagine that what kind of coloration did this thing have the coloration of this animal was so bizarre that's another thing it would look like almost the color it was massive sort of like a bear but it had pointy ears definitely really pointy ears it had a uh, almost spotted grayish fur and another thing i didn't tell you when i told you the size it was about 350 pounds i guesstimate two maybe even 400 pounds it was mad i'd say more around 400 it was massive i'd say 350 to 400 pounds it was just massive it didn't get up and walk on two legs but i saw it very very clearly from the front and when we will try to like skid it around it from the side it was a very multicolored, but it was gray. It had like almost gray patches. Beautiful in a weird way. Spooky way, but very, very stunning, beautiful. Like just freakishly beautiful in a weird way. <laughs> oh, it sounds like it. From the way you described its appearance, it almost sounds like its coat had a timber wolf type pattern on it. Is that correct? That is correct. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. That had to be a sight to see. When you guys were driving around it as it was sitting there in the road still, I guess holding its ground, you said it looked agitated at you. Was it watching you the whole time that you were doing that or what? Absolutely. In fact, I got the feeling. It didn't dawn on me then, but later when I thought about it, I got the feeling maybe, possibly, because the way it was sitting in the middle of the road, almost like it was guarding. Maybe it had pups or something. Or something that was crossing behind it, and it was holding its own. And uh, I mean, for us to go off the road in a car, I mean, it didn't budge. It didn't budge. It didn't move, and it kind of just stayed there until it was finished what it was doing, and then it, like I said, looked annoyed and trotted off. Yeah, if you're that big and that tough, I don't think you'd have to move off the road for much of anything. So I can't really blame it for doing that. Yes. <laughs> Have you heard about anyone else in that area having a dogman encounter? 
No, I haven't. But I did tell you in the pre-interview, last week your guest had mentioned something about, and I've heard this about other encounters with dogmen, about screams. I kind of almost sound like a woman screaming or something like that. And last week the guest said it was a woman screaming for help or something. In the native culture you hear about uh, sounding like a baby crying. You know what I mean? But I had some friends that were camping up in the woods, and they were out hiking around, and they were nine hours, they told me, nine hours from any trail or road, way, way, way out in, you know, go camping for a couple of days into the woods, and, or well, from the road. They were nine hours from the road, but in the middle of the night when they were packing up their headlamps and stuff, they heard, oh, they thought, a scream, a human scream, pitch, uh, uh, the, the pitch was a human scream, screaming really loud, and it was aimed at them. That's what they said. It was aimed at them, freaked them out so much that they laid on the ground, and like I told you, they told me they laid on the ground, didn't go back to the campsite or nothing until the sun came up. So it must have been pretty scary, and they don't know what it was. And if it was a human, I mean, come on, nine hours from a road, you know what I mean? I think they were scared from my understanding, what one of them told me, that they were just so scared they hit the dirt and just didn't move because it kept on screaming and it was focused at them. It wasn't just a one-time thing. This went on for a while and so they just laid there and didn't move and they laid there all night (laughs) until the sun came up. Yeah, I can't say I would have handled that any differently, so... Can't knock them for that. That had to be one heck of a strange situation. By the way, Andrew, do you have any opinions on how dogmen and Sasquatch interact? Uh, A little bit. Yes, I do. I personally believe that, and I've heard this in Native culture, that they live side by side and they're territorial. I believe, personally, when you see the broken limbs across a trail, or a tree trunk, broken branch, or even if you go up in Alaska, you'll even see where some Sasquatch clan claim territory. The natives say they actually take a tree and put it upside down, and that's marking a clan's territory. But uh, I believe that when you hear a lot about when dogman area, that they're not broken branches, they're actually bent. They actually take it and they bend it, almost loop it over a path. As a warning, hey, stay out. This is our territory. That's what I personally believe. I believe that Sasquatch, like I told you, Sasquatch and Dogmen evolve side by side and that they've developed certain territories for hunting and such. This makes sense. And I believe that they have separate territories. One marks their territory by breaking branches. The other one actually loops it over, and that's why you see a lot of that around the, uh, I guess in the Midwest, around cornfields and stuff. Anyways, that's my opinion. I'm still kind of foggy on how you look at dogmen with regards to how dangerous you see them as being. If you were living in dogman country and had kids of your own, would you be really worried about your kids' safety? Absolutely with kids. Absolutely. If I had kids and I knew there was dogmen around, or even Sasquatch, absolutely 100%. For me personally, not an issue. I don't go looking for them, but even right now, as I'm talking to you at this moment on the phone, I'm hours into the redwoods. You know what I mean? I'm way up here, and for me, it's very peaceful. I love nature. I love the redwoods, and Me, personally, I'm not scared. But if I had children and I knew there's dogmen around, for sure. Even my pets. If I knew dogmen are around, I'd worry about my pets. Well, I'll tell you what, Andrew, it's about time to wrap the show up. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, only that, like I say, I apologize. I don't mean to offend anybody on my personal thoughts about things. And, uh, Vic, I hope I didn't stray too far (laughs) off the (laughs) topics. But I've had a really fun time, and I just want to tell you, I'd I'd say if anybody has an encounter with a dog man, I know a lot of people go on the fear route. 
for good reason, but I would just say the Native American way, just respect it. You can always go the other way. I wouldn't go looking for it because they're very dangerous. I hear a lot of your guests share that. But as far as that goes, we should respect them. We should respect all creatures. And on a personal note, Vic, thank you for what you do. We all really appreciate it, man. It's it's great stuff. And I thank you, Vic, for keeping your integrity. Like I said, three of my favorites, George Knapp, Dave Politis, and Vic Cunda. And I thank you, buddy. <laughs> well, thanks so much for the good words. Like I said earlier, I'm so glad to finally be able to get you on the show here. I've been wanting to do this for quite some time. Thanks again so much for coming on. Well, thank you, Vic. And hello to all your listeners. And I had a good time, Vic. I had a good time. Good talking to you, buddy. Oh, it's always great talking to you, too. Thanks again. Well, you have yourself a great night, okay? Okay, and you don't be a stranger to me. <laughs> <laughs> Count on it. That's no problem. Well, we'll talk to you later. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye, Vic. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter and you'd like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, you can reach me at contact at dogmanencounters.com. I'd love to hear from you.